ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another episode of the Cooped Up Podcast. The podcast that is now coming to you guys in 4-3 format to stick to my artistic vision and how I envision it to be. <laughs> As always, folks, my name is Koopa, and each week I sit down with one of my friends and we talk about all, hap- thing- all things happening, pop culture, no matter how good or bad they may or may not be. And this week, folks, we have the first returning guest in Cooped Up history. You may recognize his voice uh, from such things as the Glintendo Podcast and formerly the Glintendo Circuit on Twitch.tv. Uh, you know him, you love him. He is the Batman to my V Superman. Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> please give a, a second w- warm, cooped up welcome to my friendo, Super Glintendo. Glenn, my friend, how are you? Hello there, bud. I love that I got a Batman intro. It's appropriate for what we're going to talk about. And it per- 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 perfectly encapsulates who I am. I would love to be Batman, IRL. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, I'm sure we all would. Like, who wouldn't? I mean, he says it himself. His superpower is being rich. So, I mean, <laughs> like, it's 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 something that uh, I'm, uh we've all yearned for. I'm, I don't know if I've ever been Batman as a... I'm trying to think if I've ever been any superheroes for Halloween. And none are coming to mind, That's which is sad. I don't, I don't know if I told you this story before, but, like, when I was a kid... Right. I was obsessed with Batman. Like, that's like, that's my spirit animal (laughs) is Batman. And so, you know, like when you're a kid and you're in like elementary school and they're like, oh, you know, we have like career day or whatever. And then, you know, they have you like write down what you would like to be as a as an adult. And like kids write like, I want to be a doctor or like I want to be a firefighter. Dude, Uh I swear to you, my first time ever doing that. Not as a joke, like purely seriously. I was like, I want to be Batman. Like that's the <laughs> first thing that I ever wanted to be was Batman. I, d- l- l- dude, I don't blame you. And um, in case you guys can't tell by today's title, and you know by the timing of this podcast, ladies and gentlemen, we are I think for the first time like ever on the show, we're going like in depth on like one singular piece of content for this week. Uh. Because this week, folks, we are unpacking Zack Snyder's Justice League. And when I was planning this podcast, I it didn't feel right to do it without uh, not just, you know, uh, a, 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 a DC uh, fanat- fan, uh, but also, you know, like, you, like you said, you are the biggest Batman fan uh, that I know. Um, so, <laughs> me, so me and Glenn are going to be your, your vehicle on what's hopefully not a four-hour podcast about uh, about the Justice League reboot four years after the fact, but um, you know before we get <laughs> before we get into that, um, I, I I would like to start this by by first asking you, Glenn. Um, so uh, at what point did, did your fascination with what's your history with DC? Where where did you where's what are some of your earliest memories with DC Comics and and the cast of characters that come with it? Uh, well, so that's the thing, like. Um, I grew up like everyone now is a comic fan, right? Because like the Marvel movies have become so huge. Um, but when I was a kid, like I grew up reading comic books and being a huge, like fan of Marvel and DC. And I was always more of a DC guy, which, which became like the older I got, the more rare that felt. It felt like DC heroes were considered really lame by most people and the Marvel (laughs) heroes were always way cooler. Like everyone I knew growing up was always like a Marvel guy and they were like, but I love Batman and that's it. Like Superman's lame, (laughs) Green Lantern's lame, Wonder Woman's lame. Um, So yeah, I was always more of a Johnny DC is what they call them. There's Marvel zombies and Johnny DCs. (laughs) And I was a Johnny DC. Um, I And it's not just because of Batman. Like Batman's my number one. Like I know everything about Batman, but like Superman is a, a a character that I think a lot of people hate on Superman because they don't get it. But like Superman is awesome, and he's my second favorite superhero. And um, I know a lot about Marvel too. Like I love a lot of Marvel stuff that I grew up with. Like I knew who Iron Man was in the '90s. Okay, now everybody knows who Iron Man is. Yeah. But <laughs> back in the '90s, that was like a B tier like hero. Like most people did not know him, and now he's like bigger than Spider Man. So um. So, yeah, growing up, like, I just read the comic books, watched the cartoons, and was obsessed with that stuff. And, like, I was always into drawing, so I used to, like, draw comic books and, like, draw Batman. And, like, 
Yeah, that just, growing up, that was how I was raised. And then, like, I just kept, the coolest thing about being a comic book fan when you're young is that if you were a Batman fan specifically, um, the Batman just kept growing with me as a person. So, like, when I was a really young kid, the animated series was huge, right? And it was really good. And it's still really good, even if you're not a kid. I just saw a few episodes recently as an adult. But um, then, like, you know, you're into it because it's, like, it's cool. It's like, oh, Batman's just cool. But then as I got a little bit older, I started to like Batman for different reasons. And I felt like there was always, like, a comic book or a movie or a story or something that was, like, appealing to my new interests as I got more mature. Like, some of the comic books I started reading got a little bit more mature. And then as I became an adult, like, the Dark Knight trilogy was in full swing. And, like, that's probably as sophisticated as Batman's ever been in terms of, like, the content and, like, the deeper meanings and stuff and just how high quality that trilogy is. So, um, yeah, it's been something that's been, like, in the, my DNA my entire life. And DC, for like, specifically DC, that's, those have been my favorite heroes since I was a kid. Yeah, wow. No, I, I resonate with a lot of those same, uh, with the, those same points as you. Um, I don't know if I've ever talked to you about this, uh, like, one-on-one, but... Uh, I grew up in kind of like a uh, in a much similar vein than you. You know, I, I'm I'm a much more like as I've grown. You know, as we, you mentioned, the MCU has just taken over like the the medium of like comic book movies and has kind of like set the standard of like how to you know storytell and like how to build towards whatever your big you know crossover movie is. Because you know you look at you look at the top ten highest grossing films of all time and like four of them are Avengers movies. And like, yeah. it's, it's insane. Um, but yeah. I grew up, uh, I actually grew up uh, a huge DC fan. I, uh, Batman is, is still one of my favorite superheroes of all time. But like, I had a, uh, I grew up in like the height of like the Justice League animated series hype. Um, yep. That's a lot of like where, where um, I have a lot of memories as a kid, like in the fourth and fifth grade, you know, staying over my aunt and uncle's house. And uh, my, my aunt, and uncle would want to watch justice league with me because they wanted to like have a better understanding of like what, you know, what I liked in this other stuff. And that show was, was huge. And justice league unlimited was huge. And other shows like, you know, Batman beyond and like the newer Batman, uh, series and, and stuff like that, uh, were big, but you know, even growing up, you know, I grew up with, uh, you know, the old Adam West Batman shows, uh, that I used to watch with my grandmother, uh, and, and stuff. And, and that also, like, you know, splashed over into other DC stuff. I vividly remember having this one Flash action figure that was, like, a hand-me-down for my brother. And, like, I took that thing with me everywhere on, like, <laughs> car trips to the beach. Like, I, if I if I could have taken it to prom as a teenager, I would have because I love that thing so much. Like, I love the I, – I, I'm always a fan of, like, the goofier, like, comic relief characters in comics. And, like, uh, I, I – primarily like you had you know memories of like the wally west flash because that was like what was uh yeah. pretty pretty big in like the media that i was watching but obviously you know uh as i've grown as an adult and like have caught on to the other stuff such as like you know the flashpoint paradox and, and all that other stuff you know uh, barry allen's flash especially in this case uh it, it's, it's still very entertaining and it is i'm uh, i'm noticing a, a pattern bro you you have a thing <laughs> for characters that go really, really fast. Right? <laughs> you have some kind of like between Flash and Sonic, you have some kind of like speed fetish. I don't know. I don't know if that's like a new <laughs> fetish or something. That's like something I've never seen before. I'm really attracted sexually to things that move very quickly. <laughs> I generate a lot of electricity when I move fast. You're, you're gonna like have that. to. Yeah, you're. You're. I think you're uh, attracted to a lot of friction. <laughs> <laughs> oh man you know i feel very exposed right now it might be time to just end the podcast but uh we can't do that we can't abandon the people like that but yeah it is weird to think of a time where you know uh like you know iron man thor and i'd even argue like captain america was like pretty much were pretty like b-list like superheroes and then like you know dude, the, the yeah. media completely like turned on its head and, and stuff like that dude i have so much to say about that because all right first of all i'm gonna say this all right, I grew up on a steady, a healthy diet of Marvel stuff. So even though I'm a Johnny DC, it's not like I don't know a lot of Marvel stuff. And I actually love a lot of Marvel stuff. But, like, the fact that these characters are so popular now in, in pop culture, some of it is really annoying because some of the MCU characters are, like, DC 
ripoff versions of like <laughs> some of these characters. So for example, right? Everybody knows Thanos and knows the Thanos snap. Thanos is literally a ripoff of Darkseid because DC they created the Justice League before the Avengers were a thing and they were just trying to sell more comic books and they were like, "Oh, well if we, you know, put Batman and Superman in the same comic book, we can sell people on these other characters like the Flash and Green Lantern that don't sell as well and everyone will be into it." So they create the Justice League and then they need a villain that's big enough to fight all those characters, so they create Darkseid and a bunch of other stuff. And now, fast forward to now, no one knows who Darkseid is, but everyone knows who Thanos is, and Thanos is literally, like, they even look similar, and, like, it's, it's not even a secret that they were, he was created as a Marvel version of Darkseid. So, um, as we go into this conversation, I just want a little, little disclaimer, right, <laughs> <laughs> that... I'm going to hate on Marvel a lot, but it's not because I don't know a lot about Marvel and don't like a lot of Marvel. Marvel's great, but they did rip off a lot of DC stuff. So to see where we're at now, where Avengers is where it is, and we're reduced to a, a Snyder cut of Justice League, it's painful, bro. It's just <laughs> painful. Yeah, no, I, I, I totally understand where you're coming from. I always thought it was weird as a kid that, like, there is a Captain Marvel in both DC and Marvel, which I kind of like threw me yeah. off. Uh, like even as an adult, like because uh, recently I'll, I'll spoil what I've been watching. Like on the side of this, uh, I just started watching the third season of Young Justice uh, because it finally came out on HBO Max. And, yeah, right. Um, and like I like forgot uh, when in my, in my rewatch there was like an arc where like uh, Shazam or Captain Marvel, like they call him sometimes, was like a babysitter for like you know the other. Uh, members of like the Justice League, uh, so like that always like uh was was very weird with me. But yeah, no, I <laughs> I, I totally understand. You're 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 hating from a place of love, and, and we understand <laughs> that because you I've heard you say a multiple times that spite you know Spider Man Two is one of the best uh comic book movies ever made, and I uh, I agree with yeah. you. Yeah, that movie my is, tier is list fantastic. would be my tier list for superhero movies right now would be, and I I think this is like most of like the deep comic book nerd experts would agree with this list in some order. The Dark Knight is clearly the best like single movie that is based off a comic book, right? So The Dark Knight's number one. I would still say that the original Superman from 1978 uh, with Chris Reeve, that's just a classic American movie. That's like not even a genre, comic book genre. Like most people don't even consider it that. That movie is still holds up and it's amazing. And like the score is amazing and Marlon Brando's in it. Like they have great actors like Gene Hackman and stuff. That movie's a classic. Um, then I would probably say Spider-Man 2. And then I would say probably like Endgame or like one of those like Avengers movies. Um, and then everything else is kind of like mixed in after that. But yeah, that, that would be my, my tier list. So there, the, there's no MCU movie in my top three personally even though I've seen most of them and I've seen all the great ones. Um, and I still think Spider-Man 2 overall, pound for pound, that's like the best Marvel movie, even though it's not part of the MCU. Wow. You're coming out to Gates a blazing today. You were, you, you were, you were, re you bro, were ready anyone, to talk about this. Anyone who wants to smoke can come get it, bro. <laughs> at me on Twitter, bro, at Super Glenn I want to see all the Marvel zombies. I want you to come challenge this Johnny DC, bro. <laughs> Oh, I'm here for it, but let's let's we we've alluded to Nintendo it. Nintendo with prep time. You don't want to see <laughs> the Nintendo with prep time, bro. It's I true. didn't pull up to this conversation and just improv. All right, buddy. I'm not I'm not a Marvel guy. We just we, what... we plan stuff, oh, <laughs> which wow. is ironic because the DCU on film is not planned at all, and that's the problem. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Marvel yeah. had prep time with Kevin Feige and all that, and that's why the Avengers movies are great. Yeah, no, it and and we'll definitely be touching on that uh, later, but. You know, we we've mentioned her name. Uh, it is now time for us to to venture into uh, a, a a deep breakdown of a fine powder of Zack Snyder's The Justice League. And I don't think we can talk about this movie in like full detail without talking about like uh, the the plagued like production cloud uh, that came over this movie. Um, oh boy! Yeah. So if if you're not familiar with what if you've lived under a rock for the last like I don't know like two three years. Uh, you might not know what we're talking about, uh, but a quick, like, crappy synopsis of what the Snyder Cut is, is that when Justice League dropped in uh, in 2017, 
Uh, and this film was like it was, it was in like production hell for a long time uh, to begin with. I remember hearing rumors of a Justice League film in like 2007 and stuff like that. Like it, it was like a long time coming. But, you know, Zack Snyder d- directed uh, the original uh, cut of the Justice League uh, and then in post-production uh, stepped away due to the death of his daughter, uh, if I'm remembering that correctly. Uh, and then uh, yeah. they they mar- uh, DC called in the, the bullpen. And they called in Joss Whedon. And if you're not familiar with Joss Whedon, uh, he directed uh, the first two Avengers movies, which are, again, high-grossing movies. And he's also directed a couple of other things. And we'll talk more about Joss Whedon, I'm sure. But yeah. Uh, um, so Joss Whedon steps in and, you know, orders a bunch of reshoots and stuff like that. Um, I believe, I think Zack Snyder, like, went on record and said that they only used, like, 25% of his footage. And after watching both movies, like, semi-recently, yeah, I guess. But, like, yeah. <laughs> I can never really tell. So, um, you know, the movie was met with, like, pretty negative reviews uh, upon release and stuff like that. Um, and then, you know, you hear rumblings of, like, oh, does a Snyder Cut even actually exist? It was, like, urban. It was, like, the Loch Ness Monster and, like, the, the Snyder <laughs> Cut. Like, things that, like, people talk about. But like straight up, just don't exist. So like, yeah, yeah. So, so like, rumblings of the Snyder Cut have been around for years. Uh, I think it was only in like 2018 or 2019 where like Zack Snyder actually came out and said, "It's like, yeah, like, I have the original cut of the movie. It exists." And then came the fr- hashtag Free the Snyder Cut movement, uh, which had over like 180 like thousand signatures or something like that, and like high profile members of the cast, like Gal Gadot and Jason Momoa, uh, were on board. Uh, you know, with the with the proper release of the Snyder Cut, they got a billboard in Times Square <laughs> to like say free the Snyder Cut or something like that, which is wild. Yeah, uh, that's and, unbelievable, man. Holy crap. Yeah. So like lo and behold, like through through some drama, um, you know, Zack Snyder and and uh you know HB I, I think it was with Warner Media, because Warner Media has all of their content on HBO. Um, they reached an agreement where the Snyder Cut was originally Supposed to be released in four hour long parts on HBO Max, which is HBO's new streaming service. Um, but then they, I actually found this out recently that they were just like, "Nah, fuck that. We're just gonna release the whole thing in one shot." Yeah, uh, yeah. which is yeah, which is like okay, whatever. So, uh, lo and behold, here we are now. The Snyder Cut released last uh, weekend as of this recording. Um, so, Glenn, I, I will ask you, what were your impressions of – do you remember where you were when you saw the original cut of the Justice League? And what is your, uh, what, what your surface-level opinion on the Snyder Cut? All right. So the first thing I want to say is that you mentioned earlier, like, rumblings about a Justice League movie, like, in, like, 2007. So, actually, the guy who did um, Mad Max, I think his name is George Miller – he was attached to do a Just League movie. And this is, like, before Marvel movies were a thing. This is, like, before The Dark Knight came out. Like, there was no, like, universe of superhero movies. And actually, you can find, like, concept art. Like, they were supposed to film in Australia. And then there was this famous writer's strike in Hollywood that, like, stopped the project. And then it just went away. Like, Army Hammer was cast as Batman 100%. Like, it was a real thing that was happening and it was not going to be like individual movies that come together Avenger style. It was actually just going to be one Justice League movie out of nowhere. So that's what you're referencing earlier. I just wanted to like clear that up because you can actually find like some of the cool concept art. Um, but yeah, so then let's see. What's my opinion on a surface level before we dive deep into Justice League? <laughs> so um, I do remember where I was when I saw the original one because, um, I was actually at a smash tournament and I remember like being like, Oh, okay. You know, if bracket is over by a certain time, I can rush over to the theater and catch the midnight release with my brothers. Um, and, and that was like our tradition. Like we usually would watch all the DC superhero movies like at midnight and we were really excited oh, wow. about, yeah, like we were really excited about man of steel because it was produced by Chris Nolan and, you know, it was like, it, it kind of felt like the Dark Knight um, trilogy kind of like version of, of a new Superman thing. Uh, then that movie ended up being okay, but then Batman vs Superman ended up being horrible. So I remember when <laughs> Justice League, yeah, so when Justice League was coming out, I remember just being like, I don't even really want to see this. And like, I wasn't excited to see it at all. And then I saw it. And I was really not excited to see it after I saw it. Um, 
So the yeah, so that that's like kind of my history of like when I saw it. I remember going to the theaters, seeing it in IMAX, just giving it a shot, even though I knew I wasn't gonna like it. And my opinion on a surface level of the original movie is that it's really you can tell that like what you just described, where you know um, halfway through the 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 shoot they had to switch directors, and it's actually more than what you were saying because um. Um, Zack Snyder's daughter, I think she commits suicide like halfway through him working on Justice League. And, but even before that happened, there was a lot of trouble because the thing was that Zack Snyder was filming Justice League like during Batman versus Superman. So Batman versus Superman comes out and when it hits theaters, they're in the middle of shooting Justice League and the reception of Batman vs Superman was ho- so bad was, and like so horrible and the movie underperformed like in the box office the reviews were horrible everyone is like trashing the movie and the studio like went into panic mode and they're like okay we need to intervene into this movie Justice League because this guy doesn't know what he's doing or like they're just going to produce another bomb and he's halfway through it so then you get the the everything else that happened and then bring another director in and like Already on a surface level, there's no way that movie is going to turn out great when that's what happened to it, you know? Right. Um, so, yeah, then the movie comes out. It's horrible. I didn't like it at all. And it felt like a, you know, pig's head on a horse's body. Like, it just, it really did feel like that, dude. Like, there's some stuff in that original release that is just, like, it's comical, bro. Like, it's unbelievable that that even made it to the screen. Um, so then... Seeing this, this one does not feel the way that the original does. And I would say objectively, before we get into our feelings about like specifics about how we feel about this movie, the, the Snyder Cut version of it, um, I already can say that it's better than what you saw in theaters. If you already saw the Justice League, the Joss Whedon hack job, this <laughs> is a much better uh, movie overall. Um, so I think it's a better movie. But... I also want to be fair about this because, like, I don't want to just say, like, okay, you liked it, I liked it, or it's good, it's bad. Like, you know, there, I don't want, I don't like critiquing like art in a way that makes it feel like my opinion is the one opinion that matters. Like, this was good because I liked it. So, what I will say is this before we get into the details of what we liked and didn't like, I will say that this is a very Zack Snyder movie for better and for worse. (laughs) So, if you like 300 and you liked um, Watchmen and you liked, you know, Man of Steel and you like Batman vs. Superman, you're going to like this movie because it's it has all the things that you like about those movies. And it even has some stuff that's maybe better than than what those movies accomplished. Um, but if, if there are things about Zack Snyder's style and like his approach to movie making that you really don't like that's in those previous movies, this movie is like... It just it's it's shameless about it. Like this dude hears the criticism, I feel like, and he's like, "Yo, I'm gonna double down." You guys want to critique, you know, my music choices <laughs> in movies, <laughs> and it's like I'm gonna triple down with this one. Like every Zack Snyder meme is in full display in this Snyder cut. Um, so overall, I think it's better than the than the cut that we went to the theaters and saw. Um, but I'm not going to say that it's that I really liked it because I didn't. And I, I'm i just not a big Zack Snyder guy. So, like, all the movies I just mentioned, right, and how I just mentioned that if you like Zack Snyder's stuff, you're going to like this movie. I don't like any of the movies that I just mentioned. The only one that I kind of like is Man of Steel. And that's, like, the stuff I like about that movie is, like, the stuff that Chris Nolan and David Goyer injected into it. The stuff that I don't like about that movie is the stuff that Zack Snyder's responsible for, like the stylistic choices and like the -the over-the-top action scenes and like the execution on some of the ideas. And so overall, I'll say I do not like the Snyder cut of Justice League, even though it's better than what we got before. And it's, it's simply because I'm not a Zack Snyder guy. In that's, general, <laughs> <laughs> you know what? That that's fair, and I I echo a lot of those same feelings. Um, so I actually remember, so I actually watched this movie, uh, the original cut for the first time, uh, like over the summer when I didn't have a job. Uh, I went years without watching this movie. Oh, so um, you didn't see it in theaters? Okay. So I didn't. So I had plans to see it in theaters. Um, 
but you know things happen and your word travels fast and i'm not going to go out of my way to watch a bad movie it, which it, i'm a hypocrite because i like bad movies but i'm not going to go out of my way to like watch a bad movie unless it's like a train wreck or like something like i don't know if it's if it's like I'm weird. <laughs> I, I justify my trash uh, in, in different tiers, but um, I I had the opportunity to like watch this movie on a plane, and like I watched like the first like ten minutes, and I fell asleep. Um, oh uh, my god! Yeah, it was <laughs> bad. And then uh, I decided I'm like the you know world's what? greatest heroes couldn't keep Koopa awake. Nah, <laughs> I, I could only hear Henry Cavill talk about hippos. Uh, for for so long in in those first ten minutes, but um oh my god yeah but yeah I uh I eventually watched this movie when it came to HBO Max and I was like you know what let me let me let me give this a fair shake because I feel like I'd been a little too critical of it um and yeah it, this <laughs> this movie was not great <laughs> it um it was very it had Joss Wheaton like kind of written all over it like it it felt a little too like campy for me in like certain parts like. Yeah, um, if you feel you can feel that like you're like okay, this is a scene that he put into this. Like it's like there's a lot of attempts at making it humorous and not making it as dark and stuff and like you can literally tell like oh, this is the Joss Whedon scene and then it goes back to the other scenes. Yeah, it, it's 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 very clearly you can like see those things. And I thought of like another like superhero movie that uh that Joss Whedon directed that wasn't received well, being Age of Ultron, and you hit a lot of those like same beats like you're trying too hard to like maybe shoehorn in a joke where you don't need it, uh, and like also trying to force not maybe like trying to force a romantic relationship like down our throats that like doesn't really need to be like the focus of what we're watching and stuff like that. So like I felt because uh, yeah. something I did while I watched this movie over the last couple of days is that I actually watched the Snyder cut uh, uh, side by side with uh, certain scenes from the Joss Whedon cut. Uh, to see, like, just spot any, like, major differences and stuff like that. And, like, you notice a lot of the stuff with, like, Ben Affleck and Gal Gadot is, like, just straight up just not in the Snyder Cut. There's a lot of jokes, uh, you know, that are not there. Like, a lot of, uh, <laughs> like, they essentially cut out, like, all, like, the Pet cemetery jokes that Ezra Miller <laughs> keeps making. Oh, right, uh, yeah. And stuff like that. So, like, uh, you know, those, like, comic relief punches, like, right before, like, a very serious moment is, like, uh, is, is cut out entirely. And, and I'll agree with you that like I think that this movie is definitely better than um than what I'm sure you would have watched in theaters. Um, what I <laughs> four hours is fucking insane for a movie. Like most director cuts straight up aren't even that that long. And like um, there's still like a lot of choices in here where I'm just like, eh, I it's it's a little a little much for me. But um, yeah, that's a uh, I, I guess that that that's it for your. Uh, for a mostly spoiler free review of, of the Snyder cut. Um, yeah, we would have to, I would say already, like if you made it this far, we're going to, we, there's no way to talk about this movie in any more detail without spoiling stuff. Yeah. Like we would have to. And like, I would say that, um, so there are like some major points as to why I don't like this movie overall. And like, you could tell me if you agree with any of these. Well, the first thing, and this is like a Zack Snyder special. This is like the classic Zack Snyder thing. Bro, who handed this man the aux cord, bro? <laughs> this man was in my car. If I had to give him a ride, he's. We're listening to podcasts, podcasts only. Okay, there's no music. There's no music coming from Zack Snyder, bro. There's none, dude. There are moments in this movie that are like comical at how they they like play a song in the middle of a moment, and you're like, oh my god, this is so cringe, man. Like. Bro, like what, dude? This has been a thing in all of his movies. Like, it, there's like the most random, like song in the most random moment, and you can tell that he's probably like, yeah, this is really gonna pull on your heartstrings. And then you're just like, dude, what? Like, who? <laughs> you have a great guy scoring your movie. You don't need to do this. Like, this guy had Hans Zimmer doing Batman vs Superman and doing uh, Man of Steel, and yet, like, you hear like a random Chris Cornell song, like in. <laughs> <laughs> the middle of Man of Steel, you're just like, what is, th bro? What are you doing, man? Yeah. So like, I don't know. How, did you react the same way I did? Where you're like, okay, these music choices are like unbelievable. Yeah, I definitely noticed a a a, a steady stream of butt rock in places where like I wasn't looking for it. Like, I think of that scene where they like that first uh that first fight with Steppenwolf, where like they're in the in the sewers or stuff like that. 
uh, yeah. the city and like they like jump out of the car. I forget if this was in the in the Joss Whedon cut too, but like they jump out of the car and there's like just like hard rock playing in the background. Yeah. And like I think even of like the trailer releases for this movie, they're just playing like Leonard Cohen's Hallelujah is like one of the worst choices for a trailer song. Oh, like of, my like God. of all time. Like I thought Gangster's Paradise for Sonic the Hedgehog was wild. But this was just like, oh my god! Like, what is this? Like, what? Like, what's? I totally, I had no idea what I what what I was in store for. But like, dude, and and even like outside of like the those like those like mainstream songs or whatever that he puts into the movie, there's even just like other cringy like like audio um, ideas in this movie. Like every time that Wonder Woman is on screen, right, from the beginning of the movie all the way to the end. And keep in mind, this is a four hour movie. All right, so this happens a lot. She's on screen a lot. Any time that she's on screen and doing something, they have like they'll be playing like a score, right? Like it'll just be some like epic film score. But then right when it cuts to her doing something, they have like this. Uh, it sounds like a woman like chanting, yes, like chant yep. singing in the background, and yeah. it happens every time. And it's like. It's so noticeable and it's so jarring that like it just would start to make me cringe where it was like, oh, my God, like this is happening the whole movie, bro. And it just never lets up. This man, bro, we're listening to podcasts. All right, Zach, we're, we're going on a road trip and you're not allowed to touch this Oscorp, bro. It's literally just podcast NPR. Like that's all we're going to listen oh to. God. OK, this that's... man needs to get. His Apple Music and Spotify subscriptions just revoked, bro. Like, the <laughs> Apple needs to be like, dude, you can't with this anymore. <laughs> yeah, I, I totally feel that. And, like, um, yeah, th- I definitely noticed that now that you say it out loud. That, like, any time that, like, Wonder Woman's on screen, you just hear, like, the Amazonian, like, warrior chants, like, playing in the background. And then even, like, the weird, like, something that was weird to me was, like, the initial scene where you meet, like, Aquaman, uh, like, in, uh, wherever, like, whatever foreign country it was, and, like, there's just a group of women that are just, like, chanting, and then he, like, swims away. Oh, and like, my what? God, yeah. Like, that, I that was, was like, so unneeded. <laughs> it was, like, so weird. Like, it was just, I was like, okay, this is why the, the, the you know, Joss Whedon used 25% of your footage, because 25% is about... You know, what we got in theaters is about 25% of four hours. You know what I mean? So, like, it's stuff like that that you probably – that he probably cut out, like, frame one, like, without thinking about it. He's just like, all right, the uh, awkward chanting when Aquaman's taking his shirt off for the 50th time and going into the water, yeah, we maybe we don't need that scene for this movie. <laughs> yeah, and, like, I'm not going to excuse Joss Whedon of also, like, filling the movie with, like, bullshit also because, like – Something I completely forgot about when I watched this movie for a second time is that they keep showing that one, uh, that one like Russian family that's like boarded up in their house, like trying to like uh, yeah. stop like the I forget what the bad guys' names are already, and I just watched this movie like two days ago, um, like whatever Steppenwolf. Steppen- no, but whatever like Steppenwolf's minions are called, I forget what they. Oh, are. they're the Parademons. The Parademons, yeah, and like they just keep like cutting back to this like again, it's just it's just Joss Whedon like filler. We're like. They keep cutting back to this one family in Russia that's, like, trying to fight off the parademons until, like, eventually the Justice League shows up at, like, you know, the climax of the movie and stuff like that. And, like, that's just, like, completely omitted from, like, the Snyder Cut, which is, like, a welcome uh, cut and stuff like that. Right. The biggest, I think one of the biggest things I noticed um, was I hope you guys, like, I, I, I would warn you guys, don't adjust your television, like, speed playback settings because there actually is that much slow motion in this movie. Like it is it like <laughs> there's a reason they call Zack Snyder like a baby Michael Bay in some realms. It's like Michael Bay to explosions is Zack Snyder to slow motion. It is like <laughs> fucking ridiculous, like how much like yeah. slow down there is in this movie. I'm just like, oh, like, like it's number one. It's already a four hour movie. Like we stated, this movie is four hours and like it, it's a Zack Snyder four hours, which I thought was hilarious. Exactly. said the other day, like, yeah. I, <laughs> like it's it, it's it's long, man. And with all these like slow motion cuts and stuff like that, I'm just like, wow, I am tired. Yeah. Like I was like, I was like, dude, this is literally a different time zone. Like this is like an interstellar when they're on another planet and they're like, all right, one hour here is two hours in Earth time or whatever the equation was like. Bro, there's there's four hours, and then there's like the Zack Snyder four hours, and the Zack Snyder four hours is a longer four hours. Like you will age more than four hours. 
<laughs> in the Zack Snyder time zone, dude. The slow mo thing that you brought up is so funny to me because, um, it's like so, it, it dude, it's like funny because like sometimes it's really good, right? So it's like the Flash as a character, you know, he's very very fast, and the way that they communicate that on on screen is that you're seeing things from his perspective, so everything is really slow. And that that's really cool that like the really fast character, the way that they visually communicate that is by slowing everything down. That was awesome. But it's not just the flash. Like it's like every random cool shiny moment. It's like Zack Snyder wants you to be really impressed with like, oh, this bullet bounced off of, you know, Wonder Woman's like wristband, even though you've seen it a billion times. Let's just slow it down <laughs> right here. And then we go back to normal, and you're like, every now and then, like, how annoying would that be if you're having a conversation with someone, and every now and then they just go into slow motion, and then they're back. And you're like, dude, this is getting obnoxious, bro. Can you just kind of, like, let me see what is happening? <laughs> yeah, like, I definitely agree when, like, it's just, and, like, I've always liked that trope in movies, because, like, uh, the X-Men films are done with Quicksilver, and, like, most, again, Sonic the Hedgehog does a, a similar scene like that where, like, the main character is so much faster than everyone around him that, like, he's moving at normal speed and everybody else around him is moving slow uh, and stuff like that. So, like, that's a joke yeah. that, like, I'm not bothered by. It's just, like you said, when you compound it on top of the fact that, like, every, like, major, like, every major fall and minor rift of, like, action in this movie is, like, climax with, like, you know, hard rock music or, like, slow motion. And it's just, like, it's such a weird editing choice and, like, Again, like, yeah. I, I, like, listen, I watched the Avengers Endgame in theaters. I, I sat through a three-hour movie. It felt like 20 minutes. Like, the length of the movie is not, like, the issue here. It's the fact that, like, you're compounding it with, like, all this extra stuff. And, like, again. It's, it's that it feels, it feels like the length of the movie. That's the real issue. Yeah, exactly. You know, like, you know, if you want to watch a long movie, right, it, when you watch a great movie, you're like, oh, that, that went by so fast. Like, I can't believe two hours just went by. It's like, again, you're in the Zack Snyder time so where <laughs> things are gonna feel like four hours even if you know it's gonna feel like more than four hours at times like i had to watch the movie in two sittings uh i watched like the first two hours and then i watched like the final stretch the next day like i could not do all of it in one um and yeah so and and one other thing i want to say like okay so we covered the music choices and the slow-mo and like those are just universal tropes of Zack snyder movies the other universal trope that is again like if you like Zack Snyder stuff this movie is really good in this regard but for me personally this is not something I'm into you know the movie is like very 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 colorful and very reliant on CG but it's it's more than just the usual CG um the Zack Snyder movies are like really heavily relying on green screen and because a lot of the environments are green screened and even environments that they could do in real life they choose to green screen it. Like for example, the the roof where um, where the bat signal is, right? So they, instead of just getting a real roof and shooting that, you could tell that it's on a green screen and it's in that full Zack Snyder, like super colorful, dramatic, like lighting and like it's it's almost. You can sometimes tell when you're watching this movie and other Zack Snyder movies, the actors are. You could tell that they're not reacting to something that's really there. And that it's a green screen. And you could feel it through their acting sometimes if you can't already tell through, like, just looking at the environment. This is actually something I saw Chris Nolan talk about recently in an interview where he talks about how, like, in his movies, he tries to get as much on camera as possible. And if they're going to use a green screen, they want to have, like, a really elaborate set so that, like, the actors have something to go off of. And if you look at, you know, Batman vs Superman and Justice League, like, behind-the-scenes footage of on the set... Dude, the entire set is just a green screen. Like, and it's sometimes it's fine. You know what I mean? Like, again, I get that some people are probably really into the way that looks. But for me, like, there are scenes in this movie and in all Zack Snyder movies where I'm just like, okay, like, this actor is looking at a tennis ball and you can tell that they're trying to react <laughs> and act to a tennis ball. Like, it is not a real thing that's there. So, um, so yeah, I, I feel like the music, the the music thing that we talked about, the, like the random music, the green screen stuff, and the slow mo stuff, those are just universal Zack Snyder things that I personally don't like. But I get it if you're into that. This movie does all those things really well, 
and as you would expect. Um, so I don't want to say it's like necessarily an objectively a bad thing because those are all just stylistic choices and it's not like objectively wrong to do any of those things. It's just like, you know, some people are going to be into it and some people aren't. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree with you uh, on that part. And like there's th- definitely a couple of instances where like I noticed that uh, like there's, there's this one ending shot at the end of the movie where like Wonder Woman standing over that cliffside and stuff like that where like I can definitely tell it's it's green screened and like it, it's it's rough and like I uh I, I I know that certain movies like definitely do this better than others and like even Disney to like a, an extent has like mastered the art of like green screening stuff without having you realize it because like they have that like uh I forget what it's called but like they essentially have like half of a stage built and like the rest of it behind it yeah. is like a green screen and stuff like that because I know that's how the Mandalorian was shot uh for yeah. a lot of for a lot of its stuff. Uh, which was really cool. So like, there's there's ways to do it where like it doesn't look as like noticeably like bad and stuff like that. So like, yeah. I and and agree. quick quick side note, I I do want to say to be fair, like this is something a problem I usually have with a lot of movies. Like it's not exclusive to Zack Snyder. You know that like a lot of movies nowadays are like so heavily reliant on CG and like a lot of times they they're fully CG. Like nothing that you're watching on screen is actually there. And so, yeah, to your point, and, like, to be fair, it's not like Zack Snyder invented the green screen, and he's the only one who does this. Like, I feel yeah. this way about a lot of movies, especially comic book movies, like the ending of Wonder Woman, the, like, that it was just a CG light show at that point. Like, yep. that movie was actually pretty cool, I think, like, three-fourths in, but I just think the ending was kind of like, all right, here's the part where there's a big monster because they need to end on a big climax, and it becomes this CG light show, like... And it's not nothing is real, and you can kind of feel it, even if like an audience member doesn't notice it by by saying it. Like the human eye can feel that stuff, even subconsciously, where you're just kind of like maybe that moment would have landed harder if you really believed the illusion. And so, um, yeah, that's just one of those things where it, it's worth pointing out. Zack Snyder's not the only problem with this. Sure, one hundred percent. So. Yeah, we, we, we talked a lot about, like, the, uh, you know, the, the actual production stuff for the movie. Um, I think now would be a good time to talk about, like, the, you know, the, the characters and stuff like that. Because um, there is a difference in performances and stuff like that. You can tell oh, like, through yeah. the Snyder stuff. So, like, yeah. and I guess this is, would be a good place to talk about the Ray Fisher stuff because that's, like, big. Uh, a big cloud that like you know hovers over the movie you know uh, mm-hmm. Ray Fisher and like other prominent people that have worked with like uh, you know Joss Wheaton and stuff like that have reported that like um, I want to make sure I get this right so let me just pull this article up in front of me but uh, yeah if you, uh, I don't know how close to the situ- how closely you follow that stuff if you want to like touch on it yeah so uh, for people that don't know Ray Fisher is the actor who plays Cyborg in this movie and um, he when the Snyder Cut movement was starting and the hashtags, he was one of the guys at the forefront. Like, hey, what you know, what happened to this guy's movie is kind of wrong, and we, we you know, fans want to see the actual original version of this movie the way it should have come out. So you know that happened, and then he kind of like, as the movement was going, he was kind of saying like, hey, uh, you know, there was actually a lot of problematic stuff that Joss Whedon interactions I had with Joss Whedon on the set, and. As far as I know, he, he never specified any of it. He just said that, like, you know, um, Warner Brothers is looking into it or someone is, is, is looking into it and all that. And, um, you know, Joss Whedon made a statement that apparently a lot of people didn't it, – it didn't feel like he owned up to what Ray Fisher was implying. He was implying that there was some racial stuff going on. Ray Fisher's uh, a black man. And so I'm not really sure what the details are. I actually don't even know, like – I haven't followed it too closely after what I just mentioned. Like, that's as far as I know. So I don't know if, like, any specific allegations, like, came out where it's like, you said exactly this to me, and this is how it happened. I just know that Ray Fisher lobbed some uh, some pretty harsh, like, you know, criticisms towards Joss Whedon. Yeah. That's all I know, really. Yeah. I, from, what it, from what has circulated around the Internet, um, there's an article on Deadline that talks about this that came out, like, back in February. And, um, you know, uh, Fisher, Ray Fisher, had, like slammed uh, Joss Wheaton for, quote, unquote, gross and abusive behavior and stuff like that. And like it wasn't only from him, you know, other people like uh, uh, Chris, uh, Charisma Carpenter and like Michelle Trachtenberg like came out and and, uh, and like echoed the same statements, you know, of, of Buffy the Vampire, you know, fame and stuff like that. So, um, yeah, that that's definitely like uh, something that's plagued this movie as it's, as it's come out and, you know. Um, 
it, it, it's it, it is what it is. And I will say, like in the Snyder Cut, uh, I I love uh the amount of cyborg we're getting here. Like we definitely got the proper amount of uh, Vic, Victor Stone got his got for what it feels like his just due in this movie because the the storyline of cyborg. Uh, is, is very is vastly different and affects the plot vastly differently in the Snyder Cut versus the original cut of this movie. I don't know how you feel. Yeah, about it. and also, you know, it's really... So, you know, like I said, we already covered, like, the general Zack Snyder criticisms. I think, like, now we can talk about, like, the story, the characters, things that are specific, criticisms that are specific to this movie, things we like, didn't like, whatever. Um, one of the things that I think is really bad about this movie is that there's not a lot of character development. And, like... A lot of characters, I, I again, I saw it in two sittings, and like two hours into the movie, I was like, okay, most of the characters ha are exactly the, where they left off two hours ago when I started this movie, and like there isn't, that's that's also kind of a Zack Snyder problem with all his movies is that, you know, he's not the best at like character development and like emphasizing the story stuff, and like, but, um, you know, Cyborg's character is one of the the characters that was like, He's, I feel like, the only character in this entire movie that I felt like had a real arc and had, like, he feels like a center, a central character in the movie. And it's definitely way different than what, what it was in the, uh, the release that was in theaters, the original release. So definitely, like, if I'm going to critique, you know, the character development and stuff, because um, there's so many things to talk about there with, like, each individual character... Cyborg was one of the only good things, in my opinion, about, like, the actual character development. It felt like so many characters were just, like, the same character the entire movie. Like, Wonder Woman doesn't really change. You know what I mean? Like, Superman kind of does just because he was literally dead. Yeah. Spoiler <laughs> like, alert. That's like, you know, like, he doesn't really change as a character. They kind of, like... That's another problem with this movie is that they try to act like... They try to play up moments in a way that is supposed to make up for the lack of depth. So it's like, hey, we, we don't really have a big character development arc for Superman. So instead, like, the one moment where you see him back at home with Lois Lane and he's remembering who he was, we're going to make that as dramatic as possible so that it feels like something important happened, even though it's, like, not part of a bigger thing. Like, it's literally just, like, it's just a cool moment. It... it Dude, Zack Snyder sometimes feels like he he wants to make music videos. <laughs> like, <laughs> like we already covered the odd music choices, but then I remember like moments like that where it's like, it's like the characters walking out in the dramatic rain, and like you know Aquaman takes his shirt off, and I'm like, yo, this would be a dope like music video. You're making like the smallest things seem so dramatic, and it's like, yeah, stuff like that. So sorry to go back to to Cyborg. It's like Cyborg. Um, I feel like he's the, one of the center characters in this movie, and like, they, like you said, he got his due. And if you're gonna watch the movie, his story arc is one of the best reasons to to watch the story. Yeah, no, I I 100% agree. And like, especially as someone like of of my ilk who like grew up with like, you know, uh, the Teen Titans and stuff like that. You know, where where Cyborg and Victor Stone as a character are like very prominent throughout that series, like seeing a fully fledged, like properly fleshed out, you know, cyborg, uh, like you said, like even again, you know, there's a lot of bases to cover. And I think that's the issue you have where you try to take the reverse Avengers approach where like you do the crossover movie first and then you give everybody their individual story. Oh, um, wait. So that's actually, that's exactly one of the problems with this movie. So it's like, you know how when you watch Avengers, they don't have to give everyone a story arc because they already did when in their individual movies. So like, you care about those characters because you've already seen stories with them. But DC went from Man of Steel is the beginning of their extent, their universe cinematically. And then the next movie, they just introduced Batman and Wonder Woman and Cyborg and the Flash and Aquaman kind of. And the next time you see these characters, there's not a lot of movies in between where they develop the characters, but they're acting like those movies existed. So like a lot of times I'm watching this movie and I'm like, Oh, they're acting like I already know everything about Batman or I already know everything about Cyborg or I already know everything about, like, a lot of these characters. And they're not, like, emphasizing it enough and giving it its due in this movie. Like, they're they're pretending that you already saw it somewhere else. And in some cases you did with, like, Aquaman, I guess. But with, with like, The Flash, you didn't. You know what I mean? And even with Superman, like, there wasn't that much stuff that we saw, like... So they introduce Superman with Man of Steel, and then literally the next movie, Batman vs Superman, he dies. 
It's yep. like, okay, <laughs> he just introduced me to his character and now he's dead. Like, yeah. it's just, it was just so fast. And you can tell that the studio is just like, you know, the Avengers are taking off. We gotta, we gotta catch up. And then they just like shoehorn all that stuff into it. So, so yeah, it, definitely that's how it felt. Just like what you said about like, you know, Marvel did this the right way and you can feel it. You can feel the difference in this movie. Yeah, and so just for for reference sake, so uh, Batman v Superman came out in March 2016, and then the next two movies that are sandwiched in between Justice League uh, is Suicide Squad, which has zero weight in this movie, kind (laughs) of. We'll talk about that in a bit. Oh, yeah. Uh, And and then Wonder Woman, which, again, you get the fully fleshed out origin story um, of, of Wonder Woman. And and stuff like that, which is which is great. That movie is fantastic. I like I love that movie. Uh, yeah, that's a it, solid movie. Yeah, it, it's it's a really good movie. Um, and then you get Justice League, like you said. You know, they expect you to give a you know they they expect you to like have already like had backing information on characters like Flash and, and Aquaman, and you know even as we get to again, that's a, an issue with the Snyder Cut is that. They introduce like you know whether it's for a scene or two. They introduce a, a handful of characters in this movie where it's like, oh my god! Like they're shoving so much down my throat. Like there's so much that they're trying to to, to keep up with and, and stuff yeah. like that. And that's the, I guess that's you know the Marvel effect where like everybody's got to build their universe. But you know you're expecting me to, to be invested in these characters when I've spent maybe ten minutes with them and stuff exactly. like that, which, which, which yeah. is frustrating. Um, but like we said, I think. Um, I, I was very much, uh, impressed with the performance of, of, of Ray Fisher, you know, in the Snyder cut. Again, the, the story for him is completely different, you know, in, in the original cut, uh, you know, his father is still alive, uh, after the, the whole thing, you know, uh, Silas, uh, Stone, who is a scientist that, uh, again, you learned that, um, Victor and his mother, uh, are supposed to have died in a car crash. Um, but then using the power of a... Oh my god! I already I'm already forgetting what the name of the the scheme the mother are. boxes the mother boxes yeah <laughs> I, I, I I I for some reason I always get those and boom tubes mixed up for some reason I don't understand yeah. why but, again it's also because you haven't spent that much time with all this stuff and so of yep. course you're not gonna remember most of it because it's like they're just giving it to you all in the course of one or two movies and and like really quickly um, but yeah going going to, to the, that character's father that's like an one of the more important and like well done and he did a, his father the the actor that played him like he was one of the best actors in the movie like we could probably talk about what we thought about like, like the acting and like some of the differences in that department but he was one of the best actors and uh I definitely dude it's funny because the moment where he uh dies in the movie Right. Like, you know, Steppenwolf is, is hot on him and he's about he's like it goes into Zack Snyder slow mo and you see Steppenwolf like breaking into the lab. And and like this dude decides to just he's like, you can't fire me. I quit. Yeah. And he <laughs> freaking kills himself by incinerating that thing. And like that was sadder. That moment was sadder than, you know, Superman dying in Batman Ever Superman or him coming back in this movie again because we spent more time with this character and there was more dramatic stuff there. This character had a lot of lines. He was very prominent in this movie. Like, I feel like this is, th- that's just emblematic of like the movie as a whole is like this one character was like so good. And if they just did that with all the other characters and fleshed them, flesh them out more, we probably all would have liked this movie a lot more. And you had four hours to do it. So it's even funnier. It's like all the problems <laughs> that we're talking about, like, dude, Marvel had, you know, 10 years of movies to do what they did. And, like, you guys had four hours and you could only develop one character. You know, it's, it's yeah. insane. It's hard. And, again, like, that that plot of uh, – and they, they do touch on it in the original cut of, like, you know, they show, uh, you know, Dr. Stone, you know, uh, and and uh, Victor, you know, strapped to a table where, they're, where he's going to bring him back to life with the, you know, with the mother box. Um, but, again, they just kind of glance it over in a sizzle reel and then you actually see it happen. Like in in this movie, it, it it is disturbing. It's it's pretty gross. Like all things considered, yeah. Uh, it, it was it was. But again, it it's it's uh it's a character moment. You know, you're watching this man bring his son, you know, back to life, and uh, and it pays off and and stuff like that. So that was a a great performance. Um, I will say I really enjoyed Ezra Miller in this movie. Um, I think that they gave him like just enough more things to do. And they like took away like a lot of like the cheesy one liners and stuff like that, because you know he's another character that has like quote unquote like a a story arc you know fleshed out and 
you know, his father's in jail for uh, presumably murdering his mother and stuff like that. And he's trying to get a job to, I guess, maybe bail his dad out of jail. I don't know if I missed that part or not, but, um, you know. Yeah, he, he was yeah. basically studying. He wanted to go into criminal justice because he's obviously he doesn't believe his father's guilty of the crime. So mm-hmm. he's like, oh, maybe I can, you know, become a lawyer. And then his dad's like, don't waste your life like just on me and stuff. Just forget about me and all that. Yeah. So oh, yeah. And, and, and that's an interesting arc. And, you know, they add a couple of, of cool scenes. Uh, with Ezra Miller, uh, you know, as the Flash and stuff like that, and you know, again, they they take away a lot of the cringy scenes with him. You know, they take they they cut out uh, all the Pet Cemetery jokes. Uh, they cut out that one scene in the sewer where he like accidentally falls on Wonder Woman's chest. And it's like, you know, oh yeah. my god, I forgot about that. Yeah. That is so bad. Yeah. They oh cut out, my god. Yeah, they they cut out so much of the fluff where like you're still getting like very like, you know silly slapstick like you know. Uh, you know, uh, Barry, you know, Barry Allen and stuff like that. But then you're getting those serious moments where, you know, you you watch him, uh, you know, have that monologue to himself when he has to, you know, break the speed of light to to uh, to push Cyborg in, into the, uh, you know, into the mother box and stuff like that. So, like, there, there's there's moments there. Yeah. And and I, I as, as someone that, like, loves the Flash, I, I really appreciated that. Um, and so, and yeah, he was definitely more likable because I actually really didn't like his portrayal in. uh in in the original cut um because again he's not really in batman vs superman he's just kind of like teased in it so the first time that we saw the first time you ever saw the flash on a movie screen is in the justice league joss whedon cut and dude just that wonder woman scene alone that i forgot about that like the fact that that is cut out the snyder cut beats it already just off that that one scene is so stupid and cringy and annoying that I'm just like, okay, the Joss Whedon cut is already just way worse just from that one change. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, yeah, I felt like you did where, like, I actually didn't like the way that he was done in that movie. And I, he's kind of like they made him, like, a little bit more of, like, a, a quirky millennial guy. And, like, again, as someone who grew up on these comic books, um, Barry Allen was not – that's not really the vibe that he – the character is, at like, in the comic books. So I didn't like that they kind of went that direction with him. Um, where they, I feel like they were like trying to modernize him and make him like so this awkward character. But I will agree that after watching the Snyder cut and seeing again that they fleshed him out a little bit more and like there there's the whole you know story with his dad and stuff, I by the end of it, I ended up liking him more, even though I still don't think that that portrayal or that take on that character is right. Um, I did, yeah, I definitely did like him more in this in this movie. Yeah, I, I I feel the same way. And, you know, again, everybody else, there's there's just not a lot of, like, space for, like, other people to shine. Like, you know, obviously, uh, you, they, they try to pass everybody the ball. I will say, design-wise, I love the way that Steppenwolf looks in, this, looks in this movie versus the original cut. He looks, like, way more sinister and, like, evil. And I didn't realize how, like, kind of, like, dorky and, like, realistic he looked. Uh, Dude, in, I, in, like, I didn't even... Cut. It's funny because I saw the original cut, right? And I saw the Snyder cut, and I forgot that they changed him. They literally, like, cast an actor and, like, changed his look completely for that original release. Like, I, I was like, what? Like, why did they do that? Like, it was unbelievable. Yeah, you're, he looks way better in this one. And, like, yeah. it just goes to show, like, dude, if, like, I get it. This movie is a, a product of, like, an ins- a lot of insane circumstances that are it just insane. And like they, the the studio got involved, all that stuff. But at the end of the day, man, there's no way that you're gonna like changing the the guy's vision when he's halfway through the project is not the best way to do anything. Like at that point, you have to just let him finish. And that that the Steppenwolf thing is like a perfect example where he looked so bad in that in that re, in that yeah. original release, man. Like they should have just let Zack Snyder finish this movie for better or for worse. Like. You guys are ready. Let him start. Just let him finish, and that's like a perfect example of that. Now, I I do want to touch on uh, <laughs> some some other p- characters that are introduced in this movie, whether it be for a second or not. Uh, we get the proper introduction introduction to the Martian Manhunter uh, in the in the uh, the Snyder cut and stuff yeah. like that. Um, I think it's fine. You know, the Martian Manhunter is like a, a big crucial part of the Justice League, so like it's kind of like a throwaway. Ca- like that's how you do like a proper like you know, like, small cameo in a movie. Like, he's in two scenes, and it, and it's fine. Um, I forget the actor's name, but he's just, he's the guy that played, uh, uh, he, he played another character in, like, the DC Extended Universe. He's, like, hmm. the, the, the war general or something. Um, 
I forget what his name is, but and you know, uh, one of the big things that was actually teased in the trailer, which is what blows my mind, uh, Jared Leto reprises his role as the Joker in this movie, which I think oh, is like, boy. I think it's so so. I, just to talk about that scene, you know, for a second. So this movie still retains the same post credit scene uh, from the Joss Whedon cut, where we get, uh, we note that uh, that Mark Zuckerberg escapes from jail. And um, I'm so, oh, I'm sorry, uh, Jesse Eisenberg. I, I still hate that casting. I still think that's so fucking stupid. Yeah, that's. We can get into the casting later about yeah. like other characters, but that's definitely one of the worst ones, man. Like, they've nailed it with some character, some casting. Like Gal Gadot is perfect. Henry Cavill, I think, is perfect for Superman. Dude, Jesse Eisenberg's take on Lex Luthor is horrible. Yeah, it's so yeah. different from the comic <laughs> books, and it's so bad. And yeah, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, I, I it's five years later. I still hate that. But you know, we get the we get the the post credit scene where you find out that Lex Luthor has escaped from from Arkham Asylum. Um, he is teaming up with Deathstroke, who is again fan favorite character from the uh, uh, Slade. You know, yeah, yeah, Slade of of Teen Titans fame. If you are, if if you're familiar and stuff like that. But you know, you get a uh, you you get a, a post credit scene without before the credits, which is like weird. Um. Basically, it's like this weird, like post-apocalyptic battle where, you know, uh, you know, Batman, um, you know, Flash, Cyborg, uh, Mara, who is played by uh, Amber Heard, and uh, and Slade are all teaming up to fight against an evil Superman, uh, and then for some reason there is Jared Leto as the Joker, as they have, as I guess they've like reached some sort of a truce to team up against the evil Superman. This whole scene, I thought I was having a stroke. I'm not exactly sure like what I watched because it was just so out of left field. They do nothing to set this up. It just kind of happens, and we're just supposed to accept that like Jared Leto is 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 just here for some reason, which I I, I, yeah. I don't like. So I, I don't know. I I don't know how you felt about this, but I felt very so confused. Well, the first thing I'll say is that so like in Batman vs Superman, they start like showing you like Bruce Wayne is getting these visions of like a, an apocalyptic future, right? And in that movie. They don't really explain what is going on. They just he's getting these visions, right? And that's where the first time that you see this setting that you're referring to, like it's like this. There's an evil Superman and blah blah blah. And so then Batman vs Superman ends, and they don't really explain like what those visions were about. And then in Justice League in this movie, to me, that that was one of the coolest things in Batman vs Superman because it felt like it was like the only thing that was like not predictable and like just by the book and formulaic. Well, I was like, whoa, what are those apocalyptic scenes about? And then going to Justice League, you expect to kind of figure out what that is, and you don't. They and a lot of that stuff is just completely cut out of the Joss Whedon version. So when the Snyder Cut was being released, I remember thinking like, oh, finally we'll get to see what that stuff is about. And I would say that's another disappointing thing about this movie is that for me personally, like, again, that's the only thing that made the story super, super interesting to me is like, oh, what is going on? And like, why, like, does Doomsday win and take over the world? And there's one point in this movie where you think that's going to happen because the mother box is successfully summoned Darkseid before the Flash, like, goes back in time and, like, undoes it or whatever. Um so you think it's going to happen. And the whole time I'm watching this movie, I'm like, oh, okay, this is probably that part where we figure out what's going to happen with that. And you get like a few more flashbacks here and there. And then the movie ends, and I'm like, wait a second. They never explained any of that stuff. Like I still have no idea what exactly is going on with that. And obviously, you know, the, the other part of the, the lore of this movie is that, you know, Zack Snyder was filming Justice League during Batman vs Superman, but this movie was supposed to be a two-part movie. And it's unbelievable that in four hours they couldn't include all of that. Like it, it would have been like, I don't know, a whole nother four hour movie. So you never really get an explanation on what this post apocalyptic thing is about. And the only thing you get really in the form of like kind of an explanation is like, they show you this scene that you're referring to at the end of the movie where, you know, Batman and Joker have this interaction. And I got to say, man, <laughs> all right. So I already established Batman's my number one guy, all right? And I'm, I love Batman. So, obviously, I love the Joker, and I love all the villains and all that. I never saw Suicide Squad, because I, I already knew it was going to be trash, and I did not want to see it. I'm sorry, there's no nice way to say it. That movie is buns. And so, <laughs> I never, I couldn't even sit through that. Like, I was just like, I can't do this. 
So I never saw Jared Leto's Joker. This is the first time I ever saw his Joker was watching the Snyder Cut. And I think it's really, really bad, dude. Like, I was really surprised at how much I don't like his Joker. And Jared Leto's a phenomenal actor, by the way. Like, I've liked him in so many movies. Um, so I'm not critiquing him as, like, a person or whatever. But, like, dude, it's you know what it feels like? Okay, so uh, Jack Nicholson was the, the first Joker on, you know, in Tim Burton's Batman. Before him was Cesar Romero from the Adam West era. Okay, there's nothing in common with those two Jokers, right? No. Like, Jack Nicholson was not doing anything similar to Cesar Romero. It didn't feel like the same character. And then Heath Ledger comes in, and he's the next person to play the Joker. His Joker is nowhere near Jack Nicholson's. Like, they're very, very different. Yep. Jared Leto's Joker feels like a bad impression of Heath Ledger's Joker. Like, it, it, it's like he seems like he's trying to do a similar voice, too. It's like, and then he just looks wrong. Like, his eyes are way too, like, his face doesn't look like the Joker at all, dude. And, like, again, as someone who's, like, I'm okay with, and I actually really like when things are inspired by the comics but not too faithful to them. Like, I like when th there's reinvention. I would say, like, you know, Tim Burton's Batman and Christopher Nolan's Batman, those are reinventions of the of that universe. They're not like, oh, if it was in the comic books like this, we got to do it exactly like the comics. So I'm not a purist in that sense, but this is too far. Like, Jared Leto's Joker is so far removed from anything that I associate with the Joker that it's like, I thought this scene was so bad. And it was like, <laughs> what they're talking about is so forced, and it's just like they're having this weird impromptu conversation. And then Batman... We can get into how I feel about Batman in the Snyder movies, not just in this movie, but this is, like, not Batman. Like, I just, dude, I can't with the portrayal of Batman in, in this movie and the portrayal of Joker. Like, it was just, oh, boy, I don't know, man. The conversation yeah. was so stupid, and it's like Batman's basically implying that he's going to kill the Joker and that he killed Harley Quinn. And I'm like, you know, they already messed up in Batman vs. Superman where they made Batman, like, just kill people left and right and, and like, use guns and stuff, like... They have no... Snyder does not understand what makes Batman cool. I think he thinks that what makes Batman and Joker cool is how they look and, like, Batman being on a rainy rooftop with the cape flowing. Like, the moments <laughs> are what he thinks define the character. He doesn't get, like, what the personality and the character is about because it's not in that movie. And the things he said in that post credit scene thing, both of them, it was so awkward and cringy, and it was so not what I think those characters are. But that's just my take. I'm sure there's people who are like, this is great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, as someone that has seen the Suicide Squad, um, it, it's it's even more apparent there that, like, Jared Leto's going for, like, a much edgier, like, modern take on the Joker with, like, the tattoos and, like, the grills and stuff like that. And, like, he's in the movie for, like, maybe 10 minutes, which is so – it's, like – it it's at least, like, comes and goes, like, pretty quickly in what's already, like, a pretty disappointing movie. But, yeah, I agree. Here it was just one of those things where it's just, like, it feels very forced – um, and like, yeah, why is it even there? You know what I mean? Like, what is the point yeah. of showing us that? Like, I get it. There was supposed to be a whole other movie that addresses the post-apocalyptic stuff. And like, he didn't get to finish his vision. I get all that. But even if we got that movie, I would not have wanted to see this scene with the Joker and Batman. It just feels like it has, this is the, again, we're going back into like what the problem is with all the Snyder movies, but specifically Justice League is like. Dude, the story is not just in the back seat. It's literally ball gagged and in the trunk. All right. The story <laughs> is like the story is so just like not what he cares about. And and like the movie's a collection of cool moments and shiny objects and slow mo. And it's it's not about like, hey, this character is important in this and this reason and this is how they feel and this is how this character interacts with this and we're giving it a real arc, you know what I mean? Like it just felt like this is a moment that is just there so that you can be like, yo, like the Joker, bro. Like he's there, man. And like, yeah, dude, what's going to happen in the next movie? <laughs> like that's kind of how it felt like. And it just it feels like it doesn't serve the story at all. Yeah. Like why is that there, you know? Yeah. And I do kind of tease at the, at the Flash, I guess, a little bit uh, when they're doing the scene where they bring Superman back to life. And like, uh, I guess it's Cyborg that's having the vision of like, you know, the post-apocalyptic world and stuff like that. And you watch, you know, Superman kill Aquaman. And all, yeah. or, and, and all that stuff. So, like, they, they, they tease it a bit. 
And even then, that felt out of place because I was very confused at what was happening. And here especially, like, they show the post credit scene with Slade Wilson talking to Lex Luthor. And then the next scene is them teaming up to, like, fight evil Superman. So I'm just like, what? Like, oh, that's right. Yeah, they show that Slade is, like, there. Like, yeah, yeah and he's he's he just went from the last time. You just, the first time you see him, he's walking up uh, into Lex's yacht. And Lex Luthor's like, oh, I have something that you might want, like, if you want to work together. And they're basically teasing that the Legion of Doom is going to happen because, like, so obviously Justice League is all the DC heroes coming together. And in the comic books, there's the the Legion of Doom, which is headed by Lex Luthor, and it has a bunch of, it's basically the Justice League, but with villains. And so it kind of felt like that was supposed to be the ending of the movie, like, the next movie is going to have the Legion of Doom. And they show Slade Wilson... And then he basically tells them, like, oh, I know who Batman is. And, like, you know, Batman ripped out your eye, so, like, you want revenge. And, like, here's his secret. He's Bruce Wayne. And then you see the next thing you see is the post-apocalyptic thing where now Slade Wilson, who just wanted to kill Batman and wanted his secret identity and all this stuff, he's working with Batman. And you're like, oh, okay, what's this about? How does this connect? All that stuff. Um, but, yeah, you're right. It's, like, it's just there as, like, a moment. And uh, one one more thing, by the way, I know I'm going on a tangent, bro. This movie, everyone knows who Bruce Wayne is. Batman, everybody <laughs> knows it, dude. The, I was watching this movie, and I'm just like, there's like the scene where Bruce Wayne is like looking for Aquaman in that town in the beginning of the movie, and like that town somewhere off somewhere, and they're just like flippantly walking through the town, like they're like, oh, so wait, so you dress up as a bat? Oh, so you're Bruce Wayne? And there's people just standing right there, and it's like, okay. And then later in the movie, someone else is like, oh, you're Bruce Wayne, so you're Batman. Oh, that's interesting. And like right in public, like in front of everybody, they just say this. This is the worst kept secret in the DC universe that Bruce Wayne is Batman. Like that last scene where Lex Luthor's in the, the boat, and he's like, all right, Slade, I have this ultra secret that's gonna, you know, it's gonna make you want to work with me and whatever. Bruce Wayne is Batman. And literally there's like <laughs> servers making $6 an hour right behind them, like just serving like drinks and stuff. They're like, oh, you wouldn't believe what happened today. I was at my $6 an hour job and someone told me that Bruce Wayne is Batman. Like literally everybody knows this secret in this universe, dude. It's fucking hilarious. Yeah, it's it's <laughs> it's, it's it's fucking weird. Um, And I guess now is, is a good jumping off point before I want to like move on and talk about like, uh, the, you know, the question that I pose to you, um, this is the last time we're going to see Batfleck. So, like, I think now would be a good time to kind of just get, a, you know, a, a gist of, of how we feel about, you know, Ben Affleck's portrayal of the Dark Knight. Uh, because, you know, we're, we're ushering in a, a new guard for Batman uh, in two regards yeah. because Michael Keaton uh, will be reprising his role as of as batman and some in I, unbelievable I, yeah which yeah, is which wild is to me and of yeah. course there's uh, the addition of uh of baddington uh robert pattinson will, will oh be, uh, my god <laughs> will, will be uh <laughs> will be also portraying uh bruce wayne in some capacity so uh glenn i i'm, I'm giving you the soapbox to stand on uh what is your review of, of batfleck and i guess the what the three films we saw him in and stuff okay. like that so obviously i have a lot of thoughts on this so the first thing I'll say is that I really appreciate that Zack Snyder decided with Batman vs Superman that with this version of Batman, right, they're introducing this new Batman in this universe. They actually went and finally did something that the fans really have wanted to see forever, which is they meant with a Batman costume that looks like the comic book one where it's not just a all black rubber suit from like the Tim Burton era, right? So this Batman in this universe, he's very based off of like the Frank Miller Batman. So he's much bigger, he's bulkier, he's like a little older, and he has like the short little horns and stuff. Very, very like stark contrast from the Chris Nolan, Christian Bale era of Batman. So visually, I want to say like, um, I, I like the fact that they went with that because it was really cool. There are so many scenes throughout all the Batfleck like portrayals and where he where he's in the movie where I'm like wow man in this scene he just looks like Batman like it just looks exactly like what we thought he would look like as a kid and he's doing Batman stuff like slamming a dude through a freaking floor and just breaking his spine so it's really cool in that regard um Ben Affleck is a is a pretty solid actor obviously I've, I've seen him in a million different things I think he's an even better director actually um from the movies he's directed yeah. and I would say that 
it's really hard to rate his Batman because it's almost like the opposite problem of Christian Bale's Batman. So Christian Bale, first of all, is a million times better of an actor of as Ben Affleck, right? Um, and I think that Christian Bale's Batman, for specifically like in The Dark Knight, Dark in The Dark Knight, he's almost like not even really the main character, you know, like it's more about Harvey Dent and stuff. And so he doesn't even really, he's not really the star of the show in a lot of ways, but the movie and the story are so good that it almost like uplifts his portrayal of Batman to like another level where you're like, okay, uh, he, Christian Bale's Batman is nowhere near as creative as like Heath Ledger's Joker or, you know, Michael Caine as, as Alfred and stuff like it's very good. I'm not saying it's not, but the overall story and movie made his, his Batman even better than I think it was by itself. And Ben Affleck's Batman has the opposite problem where I feel like they got a lot of the aesthetic stuff right, like the look and the voice and all that stuff. But the movies and the character development within the movie, like the stories, are not as good. So it's hard for me to say, like, was it Ben Affleck's fault or was it the movie not being as good and the, them just not giving him enough good material to work with? Um, so I have mixed feelings about Ben Affleck. But then in, in this movie, in the Snyder Cut specifically, my feelings are not mixed. Ben Affleck sucks in this movie, dude, in the, in the Snyder Cut. He's a lot better in Batman vs. Superman, and he's objectively not good in this movie. And I'll explain why. You mentioned it a little earlier, how there's like, you can tell that some of the, um, the acting is a little different than in the original release. So you could tell many times in this movie that Ben Affleck, was just over the whole project. And I remember back when this movie was like being um, made before it came out, there was a lot of rumblings about Ben Affleck being very problematic or like not not problematic, I shouldn't say that. Um, there were just a lot of rumblings about it, there, them being difficulties with him in regards to his Batman role because Batman vs Superman comes out and again, it's getting trashed by you know the box office and the reviews and they're filming this movie while that thing is being trashed. And it's like very clear that he's like, dude, I don't even want to be in this anymore. And like, there are so many scenes in this movie where I'm like, dude, Ben Affleck looks like he doesn't even care. Like he looks like yep. he's staring at a green screen tennis ball and he's not even trying <laughs> to deliver this line, dude. And like, you can feel it in his acting throughout this entire movie. It's nowhere near as good as it was in Batman vs Superman. He really just was phoning this in, man. Like, and, and there's also rumblings of, like, how he was supposed to direct and star in and write the solo Batman movie for this universe after Batman vs. Superman, and all that stuff fell apart, and then they ended up doing what they're doing now with, like, the Matt Reeves, uh, Robert Pattinson Batman. So all that stuff, all that, like, backstory and all that drama, you can see it in his performance, dude, and I think in, in this movie, objectively, he sucks, man. He's so stiff. And it doesn't even look like he gives a crap. And the other actors, like Jason Momoa, he kills it in every scene. He doesn't even have a lot of, of, of like lines and like big dramatic moments. But every scene that he's in, you go, okay, this guy wants to be there. He loves that he's Aquaman. And he's really killing this, this line right now. And he's really putting his best into it. Ben Affleck, it was the opposite, dude. It was just like, it feels like he doesn't even like this stuff, like superhero stuff. And he's just kind of doing it to get through it. Um... So there's that. And then the last thing I'll say about like the Batfleck stuff is I kind of mentioned it earlier where Zack Snyder just doesn't get what's cool about Batman and what makes Batman a, an important character. And that was like a problem in Batman vs Superman where it's like all of a sudden you have a Batman who just kills people. He runs people over at the Batmobile. He like shoots people with guns and like that might not sound like a big deal. Right. But it really is man. And like he just didn't get that character right in Batman vs Superman. And then in Justice League, it's even more wrong. Like in the comic books and in the original Justice League, Batman's role is that he's kind of like a genius and that he's super, super smart. And like he doesn't have any of those moments in this movie or in this story where like he's the guy who kind of figures things out behind the scenes and like has an ace in the hole. And like that's how the Justice League comic books kind of make Batman a superpower. And that's where, like, the Batman with prep time memes come from, is that in the <laughs> Justice League, when they created the Justice League version of Batman, they were like, all right, this is literally just a guy, and so we need to make sure that he he has, like, a role next to Superman and next to the Flash, like, these characters that are just gods. So how do we do that? The way they did that was they made him, like, 
a ridiculous super genius chess master in the Justice League comic books. And we didn't get that in this movie. In this movie, he's like just the guy that puts the team together and he has gadgets and he takes out a few parademons and that's it. It didn't feel like it looked like Batman. So I commend them on that. But it didn't feel like Batman. There was no like Batman moment for me within this movie. And overall, I think that Ben Affleck's Batman, like some of it is not his fault, but like they just got they got the character wrong in this universe. They set him up to fail from the start. They just did not set it up properly. Yeah, no, you echoed a lot of how I feel. And again, all respect to like Ben Affleck as an actor. Um, I don't think the superhero genre is 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 working for Ben Affleck because you know Matt Matt Mur- Matt Murdock didn't work out for him. And uh, this, this, oh my god, this, 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 I forgot. This, yeah, he was Daredevil. Oh yeah. my Ooh. god, man, I'd love to talk about that movie one day, but I'll get there eventually. But yeah, I feel like a lot of I agree uh, with a lot of what you said. With all respect to Ben Affleck and Jeremy Irons as a uh, as Alfred and uh, and you know and and Bat and Bruce Wayne. Uh, they just set him up for failure on, on every stop. Like I was, again, I agree with you. We're like, I like a lot of what Ben Affleck has directed. Like as a, as an actor, I like him a lot. And as a director, I think he's great too. Um, but you know, for him to constantly play second fiddle, you know, and, and, and stuff like that in a lot of these DC extended universe movies, it just felt like he never got like his fair shake, you know? Cause again, we got what three Christian Bale movies to work out. And stuff like that. So, like, uh, those truly, yeah. it, it, they just was never really given that fair shake. Now, granted, like, I agree, like, aesthetically, he looks great. The voice is great. And, and the gadgets are there. Uh, it's definitely not George Clooney Batman <laughs> bad, which is, like, <laughs> you know, it'll, it'll never be Bat credit card bad, which is, like, I, I think, like, one of the lowest moments I've ever had as a comic book fan. Um, yeah. And stuff like that. But, like, I agree. It's just, it, it feels like he's just going through the motions and just trying to catch a paycheck. Like, I felt no, like, again, Bruce Wayne is supposed to be, like, this, like, stoic and, like, you know, uh, you know, lead by example sort of guys and stuff like that. And, like, again, even Joss Wheaton's, like, poorly, like, timed comedy, like, couldn't save Ben Affleck's, like, acting performance and stuff like that uh, yeah. in the original cut. And in this movie, they cut all that stuff out. So it's, like, it's an even more, like, dry, like, going through the motions of I'm putting the team together you know, archetype and stuff like that. And it's a shame we're never going to get to see this character, like, fully realized. And, again, I'm super excited for whatever Matt Reeves and, and uh, Robert Pattinson have in store because that movie, like, direction-wise looks cool. And Matt Reeves has, like, uh, I like the direct, you know, he didn't reference all, all, like, the generic, like, you know, Batman comic books that people, like, list as their, like, inspirations and stuff like that. Like, he listed, like, some pretty deep-cut stuff that wasn't just the killing joke and all that stuff. So like right. I'm, re- I'm really excited for like what his direct like what his direction is going to be with that and again Michael Keaton's going to come back for the uh you know for for the Flash movie that's coming out which is going to tackle a lot of you know the Flashpoint paradox stuff which is which is cool so like it'll be cool to see Michael Keaton in as as Batman again which is which is fun yeah but it's a shame that like you know the last look at Batfleck is going to be like this and you know it's it it really does like kind of like sour things for me and you know yeah um the, but, the one cool thing i want to mention by the way i don't know if you caught this but one of the last scenes in the movie where you see batman um i think it's like the last scene that you see him in before the post credits thing with the joker um they show him like on top of like a new batmobile and it's it's a reference to the dark knight rises i mean the dark knight returns the comic book because he has like this in that story he has like a tank version of the batmobile oh, and it, yeah, looks, yeah. it has like a sluggish like in the like has like a slug looking look to it um and so that that's a, the cool reference i guess you know like i just want you know i appreciate the reference just want to say as a batman fan one yeah. reference please <laughs> sir thank you sir <laughs> I agree that that was I did not catch that actually that that's really cool. Yeah, when you're, I, not, you're not gonna pull a fast one on Johnny DC, all right? <laughs> you thought I wasn't gonna catch that Dark Knight Returns reference? You're wrong. Yeah. If I if I'm ever on a trivia show and it's a Batman question between me and a million dollars, I don't think there's anybody I'm calling that's not you. So <laughs> I have a red telephone ready yeah, in my bedroom for that call. <laughs> all right, when they need a Batman expert, yeah. I have a red telephone and then I go down a little fire pole. <laughs> <laughs> and just go in circles down the fire pole. <laughs> yeah. So again, I it's a shame that like we're not gonna see, you know, a lot of what these uh what these characters, you know, uh you know one what, last what? thing I wanna say. I'm sorry. One no, last go, thing. Because I, I, I don't wanna I don't wanna forget to mention that 
So even though I'm a, Batman's my number one guy, he always will be, and this is the last time that we're going to see Batfleck and stuff, I didn't really care as much that they got Batman as wrong as they did because um, I actually, you know, I already have three amazing Batman movies with the Dark Knight trilogy, and those went so far above my, my expectations and gave me things I didn't even know I wanted out of that universe that, like, I don't even need another good Batman movie again. And even, like, the first Tim Burton Batman movie still is a great movie. So with Batman, even though he's my favorite character, I'm not as sad to see that this is, like, the last thing because I know I'm going to get more and, like, whatever. I already have great things. The real character that makes me sad is Superman because Superman is this character that I think Henry Cavill is so great. He's so great as Superman, dude. He looks perfect for the role but he's also a great actor and he has like that right charm where it's like i i find that he's very earnest and good without being cheesy and like he's so good and the thing that really makes me sad is that i think this might be the last time we see henry cavill as superman so forget baffleck i don't even care about that and like superman is a character that we have not been able to see good movies of or like it, it, he's just like a character that people just meme on and it's like it hurts for me because i i thought I thought, like, I don't want this to be the last time that we see this character on screen done right and, like, with a good actor. I think that if it wasn't a Zack Snyder movie and they continued this this version of Superman with other directors and with, like, real story and writing and they give Henry Cavill, like, lines and stuff, I think more people would like that. And I think a lot of people say that they don't like this Superman, not because Henry Cavill, but because the story and the movie on paper are not good. You know what I mean? So... For me, like, I'm, I don't even care about Batman in this universe and how wrong they got him. Superman, they got halfway right. And, and the fact that, like, this might be the last time we see that is, is painful for me, man. There's really an opportunity for people to nail Superman and make everybody love Superman. He doesn't have to be this corny character that people don't like. Like, come on, man. We made the whole world like Iron Man and Captain America. Like, we can make people like Superman. Superman's way cooler than them on paper, IMO. Marvel Zombies, at me, bro. <laughs> yeah, Johnny DC is here, boy. <laughs> yeah, I, I agree. I Hopefully it's, it's not the last time we see Henry Cavill. Um, he really did bring a lot to this character, and it's fun. And, um, yeah, uh, just <laughs> – I don't know, man. I'm, I'm just uh, – I'm still thinking about, like, you know, Bat Fleck and all this stuff. Bat credit card is just stuck in my brain. Like, oh, right my forever. God. Like, rest in peace. <laughs> rest in peace, Joel Schumacher. But, my God, those movies were awful. But yeah, we'll, can we can we agree real quick that like so obviously we're being very critical because I, I think we both agree this movie's not great. Even yeah. the Snyder Cut would even yeah. though the Snyder Cut is better and Batman vs Superman is definitely not good. Um, but one thing I will say um, is that. I think we could all agree that one of the best things about the DC universe is that they really nailed it with the casting for the most part. Like I think Gal Gadot, that's like. That was perfect for Wonder Woman. Like, they nailed that. And I think Jason Momoa as Aquaman and, like, the way they reinvented that character from being, like, this really lame character that talks to fish, they made that stuff really <laughs> cool. And I think he's great, and he looks great, and they did an amazing job with him. Um, I think that Henry Cavill, obviously, is great. Uh, Amy Adams as Lois Lane is great. Um, Jeremy Irons as Alfred is great. There's some whack choices, like Jeremy... <laughs> like, uh, um, the Lex Luthor stuff and like I think yeah. Jared Leto's Joker and like they got the villains wrong probably I would say overall and but, underrated J.K. Simmons as as uh, Commissioner Gordon is awesome I think he's great <laughs> dude I couldn't I can't with him man dude I, that <laughs> I dude I was telling my brother this earlier where I'm like they had Willem Dafoe as one of the Atlanteans and then they had uh they had J.K. Simmons as Commissioner Gordon right and I was like. Can like those characters are barely in the movie. Can they just have casted like a, a, a guy I don't know? Because I'm watching this movie and I'm just thinking, this is the guy from Burn After Reading and from the, the Spider Man trilogy. And I I laugh <laughs> whenever I see J K Simmons. I laugh because he's so good and funny as J Jonah uh, Jameson in Spider Man. I can't not see that. So when I saw him in this movie, I just started laughing, even though he doesn't have any funny lines and he did a great job as Commissioner Gordon. I was like. Oh my God, that's J. Jonah Jameson, bro. That guy is so good. Yeah, it was just funny. 
And yeah. then, of course, Willem Dafoe was the Green Goblin in, in the original Spider-Man movie. Yeah, such an odd, like, that guy casting choice for sure. <laughs> Willem Dafoe just coming off the bench and scoring 20 points as, like, a random Atlantean. <laughs> but, yeah, I, I don't know. I love J.K. Simmons. Put J.K. Simmons in anything and I'll watch it. I love that, man. He's, he, he's so great, man. He, that guy's he's, awesome. He's great. But, yeah, so that's our that, – that's we've covered, essentially, I feel like, everything about this movie. Again, if you have four hours to burn – Watch it once. This is definitely the definitive version of this movie. Um, but granted, a polished turd is still a turd, unfortunately. Yeah. And I, I want to have faith in, in the DC uh, Extended Universe. You know, I I don't want to hate all these movies. And, like, uh, to be fair, a lot of the newer movies haven't been bad. You know, Aquaman was really good. Shazam, Shazam was, I heard, Shazam, was good. Shazam yeah. was really good. And, listen, we got uh, The Suicide Squad coming out later this year, directed by James Gunn. And anything yeah. that James Gunn touches, I'm a fan of. So if, if that movie's bad, uh, I'm selling out hope. I'm selling all my, all the stock I have left in DC. And yeah. I'm sure the only DC you'll see me rocking with is the shoes still. Um, <laughs> but that's about all I got. Uh, do you have any closing thoughts on the Snyder Cut, Glenn? Um, yeah, I mean, I'd say again, like, you know, that I just gave my opinions. Obviously, I didn't really enjoy it, but it's it's if you again, like if you have liked Snyder's movies, you know, this is right up your alley. And I think this is better than Batman vs. Superman and it's better than the Justice League that came out. So, like, I don't know. If you like Zack Snyder movies, there's a lot of it's it's light on story. Again, it's the story's ball gagged and in the trunk. It's not even in the back seat. And it's like there's a lot of shiny moments, which is cool. And for a Johnny DC like me, I'll admit. There are definitely moments where I'm like, wow, man. Like, there are little glimmers of, like, you see these characters together doing cool stuff, and you're like, this is what I dreamed about, man, when I was a kid. Like, I could finally see these characters on screen. And, like, seeing Superman do cool stuff was just, that was awesome. You know what I mean? Like, overall, it's not a great story. You know everything that's going to happen before it happens, you know, and it's a CG light show. (laughs) But, you know... There are redeeming qualities of it, and again, it, you know, it's on HBO Max. It's free. Like at the very least, you could check it out. There's, it, you know, you're not going to the theater to pay money to waste if you didn't like this. So, th- those are my closing thoughts on, on that movie specifically. Yeah. Um. If Suicide Squad's bad, I'm out on DC until the Zatanna movie comes out, and then we'll talk. <laughs> but, uh, so I did pose one question to you, uh, this week, and we can talk about the other stuff later because I'm sure we'll we'll have plenty of opportunities over the summer to talk about comic books. I'm sure. Definitely. Well, I'll definitely find an excuse to talk about it. But I saw this question posed on the internet, and I'm going to ask you this question, Glenn. Um, of what film would you want to see a Snyder cut of? Which is again. The Snyder Cut of uh, is, is, you know, what's, what's a, a movie that you would love to see a four-hour uncut, you know, four-by-three ratio movie of? <laughs> All right. So um, originally, my answer was going to be the sequel to the original Superman movie. Um, so it's funny because the very first superhero movie ever is, you know, 1978, Chris Reeve Superman, right? And then... It's very similar to what happened with this movie where they were filming Superman 2 at the same time as Superman 1. And even though, unlike Batman vs. Superman and unlike what's going on with this movie, the first Superman comes out and it, it the reviews are great. The box office is great. It's universally praised. But for some reason, the studio decides that the director, Richard Donner, uh, who also directed like The Omen and some of the Lethal Weapon movies, he's just an all-around great director – you know, he kills it with the Superman movie, and then they're, like, halfway through him doing the second one, his relationship falls apart with the producers, and they hire a different director to finish the movie. And so the movie that everyone saw as Superman 2 is, like, it has a lot of weird, campy stuff in it, and it's, like, it's eerily similar to what happened with Justice League. Um, so originally, that was my answer. But the problem is that in the 2000s, I want to say, like, so like 20, 2010, around there, uh, Richard Donner actually did already release the the what they call the Donner cut of Superman two, so that movie ended up like getting that 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 uh, treatment. Um, so that that was my original answer, but now my real answer is Spider Man three, uh, Sam Raimi's Spider Man three. Oh, 3. that's a great answer. And the reason for that is because everyone kind of knows that the original Spider-Man movies are great, but the third one is definitely the one that people are like, all right, that one was really not good, especially compared to how amazing two was. And 
if you follow, again, if you're a deep nerd like I am on this stuff, if you follow the lore and the hieroglyphics of that time period and you decipher what was going on, what happened was that um, Sam Raimi, he wanted to tell the story of the Sandman and Vulture. And Vulture was going to be uh, played by Ben Kingsley. And they were playing with the idea of maybe having Black Cat in there as Anne Hathaway, which is hilarious because she ended up to be Catwoman in The Dark Knight Rises. But anyway, so the studio uh, and the producer, Avi Arad, they, the fans really wanted Venom, right? And, you know, after the success of Spider-Man 2, they're like, oh, my God, like, Venom has to be in the next movie. Like, when are they going to do Venom? And Sam Raimi's generation of Spider-Man is, like, those original villains. And Venom is, like, a 90s, like, 80s and 90s, de- like, much later Spider-Man villain. So mm-hmm. he went on record saying, like, look, I didn't want to do Venom because I didn't grow up on Venom. I grew up on the characters that, you know, I put in the movies, and I don't really get why people like this character. So eventually the studio makes him change his plans, and instead of having the Vulture and Sandman, we end up having Sandman and Venom. And that all of the things that are bad about Spider-Man 3 are the things that have to do with Venom. Like, if you watch the first half of that movie... It's a great movie. It's so good. And all the stuff they're introducing is great. It's the Eddie Brock and Venom stuff that they made him do that he didn't want to do that ended up killing that movie. I would say with one other exception. The one thing he added to that movie that's really bad, and again, this is a spoiler warning if you haven't seen Spider-Man 3, is that you know they made it so that Sandman was the killer of, uh, of uh, Peter Parker's Uncle Ben in the first movie. And that was like cringe like why'd you guys yeah, do that, that, that that's that, like in, 14 years later it still makes me very angry yeah so like but like outside of that <laughs> outside of that sandman was a real character and you know he you know he's motivated by like this relationship with his daughter and he's a guy on the run and he accidentally gets transformed into this monster all this stuff and that movie would have been so great and i'm gonna be honest i still really like that movie overall um but yeah the stuff that they added that they forced him to add with the venom stuff is so it's really what makes the movie suck and i would love to see a snyder cut sam raimi comes back and like obviously this can't happen because like it's not like they shot ben kingsley as the vulture they didn't shoot any of that stuff like that stuff was unlike justice league they they kind of nixed those things early on in the 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 movie development so those things don't exist but so this isn't even possible but in in a perfect world i would love to see sam raimi's original vision for like this is what Spider-Man 3 would have been and not what you guys saw. So that's that's probably my answer. That's a great choice, man. That that movie is like ugh. <laughs> it, it it's a shame of like the you know the the plague production cycle um of that movie and stuff yeah. like that. And it's that's that listen man, I love Topher Grace and that 70s show, but Eddie Brock is like still some of the worst parts of that movie. I agree with you. Oh my god. 110%, but um, yeah. my, so I have two answers and again, they follow the same track of like movies that were in the midst of being filmed and then due to production changes, it had to be changed immediately. Uh, had to change ship completely. Uh, and my first choice is Solo, uh which was originally supposed to be directed by Lord and Miller. Uh, who directed a little ditty. I don't know if you're familiar. It's called uh, Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse, uh, if you're oh. familiar with that. Yeah, so... Great movie, by the way. Yeah, fantastic. Like, Lord and Miller are primarily known for their, for their comedy and stuff like that. They've directed uh, Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs uh, and stuff like that. And um, I had the Wikipedia article up in a second, but they're primarily known for, uh, you know, directing comedies and stuff like that. And then halfway through production, um, they're replaced by uh, director Ron Howard, who reshot about seventy percent of uh of the movie, and uh, it, there was a shame because there was like a handful of characters that uh um it, it actually the, the the craziest thing when I was researching this is that the 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 villain in Solo again the spin off story of Han Solo and Chewbacca in in Star Wars one of the anthology films, uh the bad guy in that movie is portrayed by Paul Bettany. If you're again if you're familiar with the Marvel uh cinematic universe. You'll know him as Jarvis and Vision, and uh, also he was in uh, he perfect uh, Jeffrey Chaucer uh, at one point in time, which is hilarious. But, Chaucer, yeah. Uh, so the villain in that movie was actually supposed to be portrayed by Michael K. Williams, uh, and due to reshoots and stuff like that, and scheduling conflicts, he was not able to return to the movie uh, to you know to to do his reshoots and stuff like that, which is uh, 
you know, which is a shame. And again, the movie is fine for what it is, but I feel like we could have just gotten like a much more refined product of like, uh, and and stuff like that. Cause like, it just feels too, it feels too self serious for a Han Solo movie. Cause like, I don't know as a star Wars fan, like Han Solo is, is again, shoot first, ask questions later. Like, some of the casting decisions are, are bad. Like, Donald Glover's great, but, like, every, he carries that movie on his shoulders up a mountain in the snow, Rocky <laughs> Rocky Four style. It's it's bad, but... Oh, boy. Um, the second choice I came up with, and I thought of this on the car ride home, uh, is Toy Story 4. <laughs> um, Wait, but, what? So Toy Story, Explain that. So Toy Story 4 was originally supposed to be written uh, by Will McCormack, uh, who uh, he... Uh, He's written a, uh he's appeared on uh episodes of, of the Sopranos and he's written some uh he's he's worked in television a lot and, and stuff like that. He's primarily a television writer. Uh and it was also supposed to be co written by Rashida Jones from Parks and Rec or and The Office, if you're familiar with that. Uh mm-hmm. and then uh they lived halfway through production due to uh you know, due to conflicts of interest and stuff like that. Uh the original plot uh of Toy Story uh four uh, was supposed to be it was it was supposed to be a romantic comedy and stuff like that. They wanted to t- film a romantic comedy. Uh, they the Bo Peep was always supposed to be the p- purpose of Toy Story four to find out what happened to her, like in between Toy Stories three and four. Right. Uh, right. And the, the from what I read originally of the movie, the film was supposed to be a a romantic comedy between Woody and Bo Peep, which I think would have been cool. Uh, but instead, you know, the director steps down and, uh, Jones and McCormick leave the project and stuff like that. Um, and again, there was a whole lot of like, you know, stuff with John Lasseter at the time, cause he was supposed to co-direct and he, you know, stepped down due to allegations of, you know, uh, toxic workplace stuff and, and, you know, and sexual misconduct. It was really, it was really bad. Um, yeah. Yeah. Stuff like that. Um, so what, what we ended up getting out of Toy Story 4 was like fine. It's pretty superfluous in regards to like Toy Story stuff because I'll stand, I'll die yeah. on this hill. The Toy Story trilogy is like is, is the be- is one of the best trilogies of all time. Like the way that that movie ends, it's 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 heartbreaking and it's great. And to- Toy Story three is unbelievably good. That might be like the best third movie I've ever seen in a series. Like I don't think there's I a agree. third movie in a trilogy where you're like what like this had no business being this good man yeah if if anything the second one is the weak link which is really odd like usually the first one's great the second one's like the best one and the third one is just disappointing in some regard uh but yeah toy story 3 is just unbelievable man that's a great movie yeah i'm looking rush hour straight in the eyes with that one um (laughs) but um yeah i don't know i feel like uh this and uh, parts of this movie feel so rushed because i feel like they're they, they, there's so many characters in Toy Story at this point because they are combining Woody's toys with Bonnie's toys. So, like, so many characters get shafted in screen time. I hate the direction they take with Buzz in Toy Story 4 because they essentially make him, like, the buffoon, which is, like, really disappointing and stuff like that. Oh, oh that's kind of true, yeah. Yeah, like, they, they, do, they, they do to him what they do with Drax in the MCU where, like, they make him, like, you know, mm-hmm. less self-serious and more, like, dopey comic relief. Which like kind of makes me sad and stuff like that. And again, they want to focus on like the, you know the newer characters that they introduce in the movie uh, and all that. But like, I feel like if I got like a four hour like fleshed out Toy Story four of like you know, I, I would I would feel pretty good about that. Especially because Tom Hanks even said in like the press tour for the show that like he was crying recording his last lines you know for this movie and stuff like that. And I'm just like I'm, I'm watching yeah. this movie. I'm just like, where's like, where is it? Like, like, where's the, like, where's the part that's supposed <laughs> to make me sob uncontrollably? And like, the movie was very emotional because you know I have so much invested in this franchise as a Toy Story fan. But like, where was it? So I, I don't know. I feel like I would love to have seen Rashida because uh, I love Rashida Jones as an actress. I think she's great. I would have loved to see her direction yeah. on 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 where this would have gone. And I don't know. Maybe for Toy Story Five, I'll, I'll, I'll get that one day. But. Uh, <laughs> Until I then. hope they just never make another Toy Story because, like, they already just did such a good job. <laughs> they didn't even need – 4, I actually – I thought 4 was good, but, like, again, it didn't need to be made. Like, it just didn't really change anything. So I was just like, they could – you know, this is literally perfect. Just leave it where it is, all right? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll definitely find a way to shoehorn talking about Toy Story on, on, a, on a much longer form podcast. But um, we are uh, pushing uh, – yeah, we're, we're, we're at the end of our – 
of our time here, Glenn. It didn't take us four hours to talk about the Snyder Cut, but I do feel like we we definitely uh, encompassed a lot of how we feel. So thank you on going on this journey and and consuming this product with me when I'm sure you probably would have waited <laughs> otherwise to do so. So I appreciate you. Yes, thank you, bud. And I uh, I I as much as uh as much as I wanted the DC universe to be better than the Marvel universe. Um, I enjoy talking about this stuff and, uh, I enjoy talking about the Zack Snyder. <laughs> and yeah. like, it's, it was fun to do all that and to indulge in the Snyderisms, bro. Again, if that guy's in your car podcast, no way we're doing any aux cord business with Zack Snyder, bro. <laughs> yeah. Join no me, join me and Glenn on our next movie breakdown where we talk about, uh, <laughs> Where you talk about uh, Ben Affleck and his uh, and his uh, many roles in a View Askewiverse, um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, but, uh, Glenn, let the lovely people know where they can find you. All right, Marvel Zombies. I know I ticked you guys off already. You know what I mean? Because even though here's what I'm gonna say as my parting words. All right, Marvel, you guys got the the cinematic universe down. I'm gonna I'm gonna say DC messed that up. Fine, but DC still has the best overall superhero movies, okay? Because you guys aren't touching the Dark Knight, all right? As one, uh, you guys are not going to touch that. And then, you know, we have the Batman anime series. Animation-wise, you guys can't touch us, all right? And in terms of solo stories, Marvel can't touch us, all right? DC is just, overall, we're still, we're still number one, baby, all right? Superman and Batman, we're number one. So all you Marvel zombies that are tight, that are mad, you guys get at me on Twitter, at SuperGlintendo. And I have a weekly Nintendo slash Smash community podcast um, called the Glintendo Podcast. So if you want to come hear Koopa on there, he's a frequent guest. And we talk about video games. But we mostly talk about Nintendo stuff. Because obviously Nintendo, like DC, they're just the best, man. They're number one, baby. (laughs) So at me on Twitter, at SuperGlintendo. Johnny DC is out, bro. (laughs) I... I love that. Uh, and thank thank you again to Johnny DC for joining me. And of course, uh, if you guys are so inclined to do so, um, you can follow me on Twitter at uh, at Koopa NJ. Uh, follow the, uh, the show at Cooped Up Pod uh, on Twitter.com. And again, email us questions, baby. Love to interact with the fans. Uh, I'm going to make sure to do a better point at advertising that. And uh, yeah, follow me on Twitter uh, for all that stuff. Episodes go up every Saturday. And until then, folks, Have yourselves a wonderful night and uh, take care. Peace out.